cognitive warfare is like, uh, in English we talk about psyops, psychological warfare. But psyops is for aimed at uh, an enemy on the battlefield and you want to psych out the enemy with misinformation, but your main focus is the battlefield. Cognitive warfare, the main focus is the public's, both your own public and your enemy's public. And you're, you're trying to manipulate the war via public opinion. Um, so the main principle is, uh, as one Israeli scholar defined it, um, cognitive warfare is the art of turning your enemy into pacifists and your own people into patriots. Uh, and in the case of the Palestinian cognitive war against Israel, it's the art of making um, your, it, paralyzing your enemy with guilt and inciting your own people with hatred and a desire for revenge. And unfortunately, uh, as my talk is going to uh, evaluate, enumerate, the mainstream news media has played a central role in allowing and encouraging, and in some senses playing uh, a major role in helping Palestinian cognitive warfare succeed. And the consequences of that are not just terrible for Israel and for the Palestinians who are the victims in this, but also for the West. Well, um, I, I define an honor culture as a culture in which it's not only accepted and expected, but in some cases even required that you shed somebody else's blood for the sake of your honor. Uh, so, for instance, in the Arab world, you have honor killings in which you kill a daughter or a sister because she shamed the family. So you save the family from shame by shedding the blood of the daughter, killing the daughter. Um, duels are a form of honor shame. You, you insult me, I, I must have it in blood. I must wash my reputation in blood. So the West is by and large, uh, you know, it's not that we don't care about honor and don't want to avoid shame but we're not willing to resort to violence and we, in some senses, we don't allow ourselves to break the rules for the sake of saving honor. Even to the point where we feel it's important to be honest and self-criticize rather than lie just to save face. Okay. Um, now, in honor shame cultures, it's the opposite. There's a very low trip switch to violence. Uh, violence can come easily. Um, and um, there's a lot that uh, people will readily do to save face. So one of the problems is that in some senses we all know this. We all know that, for example, the, uh, Muslims are very touchy. You do, you, you, you do a cartoon of Muhammad, even if it's not a nasty cartoon of Muhammad, they'll riot and scream. The Pope says uh, Islam is a violent religion and they riot in the streets and kill people saying, how dare you call us a violent religion. So we all understand that. But we don't want to say it. We're afraid to say it. We're, we're reluctant to say it. And one of the things I think at work is we're trying to spare their feelings. Uh, in other words, the media very often will protect the honor of the Palestinians, the honor of the Arabs, the honor of the, um, uh, of the Muslims. And as a result, you can see it, for instance, in the interviews. If you look at the way the media interviews an Israeli representative, they'll interrupt him, they'll challenge him, they'll contradict him. Um, you'll never see that with an Arab representative. They're, they're very careful to show honor and to show respect for the people that they're interviewing. So in a sense, what we end up with is a media that, that can be manipulated very easily um, and is quite ready to present themselves as um, uh, uh, advocates for the side whose honor they want to preserve. Well, first of all, I think it's a perfectly legitimate thing to say what's a legitimate criticism of Islam and what is insightful. Um, just as I think it's perfectly legitimate to say what is legitimate criticism of the state of Israel and what is anti-Semitism. Um, so there are all sorts of interesting questions that arise. Uh, is it incitement to call the Israelis Nazis? Um, I think so. Uh, is it incitement 
to call the Palestinians Nazis. Um, historically, there's plenty of evidence to support that. It's not, it's not an imagined accusation. It's an accusation with basis. Um, but it will incite. Um, the part of the problem is who's the audience and how do they get incited? Um, a small thing can incite an honor shame culture. It takes a lot to incite uh, Israelis. Israelis it, the level of criticism Israelis will take is extraordinary uh, before they start screaming. They start screaming at being compared to Nazis and apartheid and stuff like that. But, you know, the sort of criticisms of Israel are a dime a dozen. Criticisms in the Arab world aren't. Uh, and I think that w what's been set up is a kind of radical imbalance that I tried to explain in terms of this honor-shame issue. Uh, you can see it in the Brevik affair. Um, right after the Brevik affair, all the people who identify criticism of Islam as Islamophobia, in other words, who have a very narrow uh, range of what they consider legitimate criticism of Islam, were yelling that the people that Brevik cited in his manifesto had, uh, were responsible in some way. They in, in, incited in some way incited Brevik to his deed in some way. Now, nothing that these people said said, Brevik or whoever is reading this, go out and kill a bunch of Swedish youth. Um, there's nothing inciting in there. There's criticism in there of Islam. Um, on the other hand, these same people who will say, um, you know, anybody cited in the Brevik Manifesto is in some way responsible for what Brevik did, refuse to even discuss incitement in the Palestinian and the Arab and the Muslim media. So you've got people on Palestinian TV and in Palestinian pulpits who are saying, go kill the Jews everywhere. And there are people who then go out and kill Jews wherever they can. And uh, these same people who are blaming people cited in Brevik's manifesto won't even address the issue of incitement in Palestinian media. So we're dealing with a completely skewed universe. Um, I think these questions need to be discussed. We need to talk about what's legitimate criticism of Islam and what isn't. And that brings up the subject of how much can we expect from Muslims that they take criticism? And if they can't take criticism, should we therefore pretend that there's nothing to criticize? That's unfortunately the direction that a lot of thought goes. In the United States, we just had the President of the United States set out that no mention of jihad should be made in discussions of Islam to law enforcement. Now, what, you, they get a version of Islam that doesn't, that isn't what they're dealing with? That's our problem. We have to talk about these things.